All right, welcome back, everybody. In this lecture, we're going to be covering a very important topic that relates not only to psychology, but hopefully a number of other areas that you might find yourself exploring when you leave this class. It's a topic called memory, and in it, we're going to be exploring not only the concepts around memory, but also some of the applications once we started to understand how this process actually worked. Before we get into a lot of details around memory and some terminology that we need to understand, I do want to also provide us with some context as to why we're sort of in this topic at this point. If you remember back to our previous module, we spent a lot of time talking about the process of something called learning. We primarily did it through the lens of behaviorism and talked about two primary types of learning called classical conditioning and operant conditioning. But really at the heart of those was just how we acquire information from our environment and use it for future interactions. Well, how we store that memory in our head and how it sits there is what this next cognitive process is all about, what we call memory. And many cognitive psychologists who want to understand how the mind works do spend a lot of time looking at memory and all of its different components so they can have a much better grasp of this really critical component to the human mind. It's important to note that even in the early years of psychology, there was this implicit recognition of the importance of memory. If we want to understand things like emotions and thoughts and all of the other really critical pressing ideas that psychologists wanted to explore, we had to have some grasp of how memory worked. The problem was, was even when psychology was starting to form, many psychologists recognizing the importance of memory also contended that we just weren't at a place where we could study this really complex thing. As a science, and people trying to approach things in a scientific perspective, many people in the mid to late 1800s worried about whether or not we could truly understand memory the same way we could understand things like language or sensation and perception. One of the big issues was the fact that there were so many individual differences that we had to control for in memory research. Not just differences in terms of capacity and storage, but differences in terms of people's own memory experiences and how people take information and, and bend it in different ways. Another big issue when it comes to memory research is how we determine not necessarily whether or not somebody remembered something, but the gradients of memory in a lot of different situations. It's a lot easier to test an all or nothing something, but when we're talking about something sort of working in the cognitive world and something that we're not sure how it's actually working, we get to a place where, unfortunately, there was a lot of concern, a lot of worry over whether or not this would be something that we could study scientifically. And because of that, a large period of time until the mid to late 1800s, Memory was sort of this taboo topic that people could reference, but didn't really try to set up labs to study. This was all changed in the late 1800s, around 1875 and beyond, when a researcher named Herman Ebbinghaus sought to find a way to scientifically tackle this broad concept of memory by minimizing a lot of the problems that many people had cited. One of the things he did to try to first attempt to understand memory was control for a lot of the individual differences that people contended made memory research impossible by using just himself as his primary research subject for a number of years. And his attempts to control for individual differences in memory on specific topics and the likelihood of certain things being easier to remember than others Instead of testing his memory on stories or films or things that he'd encountered, he decided to create a list, an exhaustive list of these things called nonsense syllables. These one-syllable word-like things that were intentionally designed to have no specific meaning behind them. In his research, he had this gigantic Rolodex of nonsense syllables that he would page through and use for a variety of different types of memory tests that he could use to hopefully, he thought, 
apply to most people in the population and describe the basic principles of memory, there's how information is stored in the mind, from a, you know, a basic assumption that his mind and his memory was relatively normal. And through his work and his design, which we'll talk about in the next slide, he was able to give us the, the first inklings of a conversation on how information got into our head, how it stayed there, and how some of it trickled away when we looked at things like acquisition and forgetting. How did he do this? Well, Ebbinghaus's work went a number of different directions, but he always, in his studies, used these nonsense syllables with different kind of characteristics to the ways he would try to memorize them. Sometimes he would present himself with exhaustive lists of nonsense syllables. Other times he'd present himself with just a few. Sometimes he'd ask himself to learn the material, where he'd have to memorize everything on the list that varied in size, or sometimes he'd ask himself to just read the material. Sometimes he would give himself long pauses between the learning or the reading. Other times he would just give himself a few fractions of a second. And through all of these exposures, where he tweaked things, he was able to not only get a basic sense of how what we call nowadays short-term memory worked and how we were able to store new information in our head, but he was also able to design all of these elaborate learning and forgetting curves that took into account the variety of different situations that we can encounter where we're tapping into different aspects of our memory. And what's really important and kind of amazing to note here is that a lot of Ebbinghaus's findings from over a century ago seem to pan out in today's findings on how memory works for the vast majority of us. And this is kind of unique. You know, most people, when they tend to study things in psychology, focus on it because they're either really good at something or sort of lacking in something. But Ebbinghaus and his Infinite wisdom seemed to recognize that his memory was pretty much like everybody else's, and he could take his performance on these tasks and apply it to the vast majority of the population. And from it, we really did get a sense of how memory worked, and more importantly, we had our first ability to, to kind of verify that there was a scientific way to try to tackle this behemoth in memory that was so critical to understanding the mind. Just so we can give a little bit of, kind of homage to Ebbinghaus and give ourselves a chance to understand what his life like was like for the many years that he studied memory, I thought we'd recreate one of his nonsense syllable activities. So what we're going to do here is I'm going to have you sit back and hopefully with a pen or pencil or a computer in front of you, get ready to then first listen to a list of nonsense syllables that I'm going to read to you and then have you write, right after, all the nonsense syllables that you can remember. Now there's lots of things that we're going to be doing here that aren't necessarily perfectly aligned with Ebbinghaus's work. Right, instead of you reading the nonsense syllables, I'm going to read them to you. You're going to have to, of course, guess what the letter combinations are for the sounds that I'm making. And, of course, you don't have all the control of the environment and other things that Ebbinghaus had to ensure that this example we're going to go through is perfectly representative of how we could find kind of the, the, the limits of your short-term memory. But hopefully through experiencing this, you can understand what the nonsense syllables were like and well, what his experiences were like with all the different types of tests he ran. So if you can get ready and sit and back, get that thing out if you need it uh, to write with either a piece of paper with a pencil or pen or a computer that you can type in. I want you to, again, first listen to the list I'm going to read, and then right after I'm done, try to write down as many as you can. Let's see how we can do. Pause me if you need, otherwise we're going to get started. Here we go. Bem. Pab. Fup. Gom. Hux. Sis. Vob. Tag, hin, wef, nip, rud, tig, dev. 
and write down as many as you can. We'll go on to the next slide. Pause me if you need to. All right. So going back to getting some context from the work of Ebbinghaus. As I mentioned before, what he was able to achieve with this work was the first ability to, to kind of verify that we could scientifically study the topic of memory the same way we could do with sensation and perception or even learning principles. It also gave us some frameworks for different types of memory that could exist and, and of how memory capacity worked in a variety of different situations. However, even Ebbinghaus was willing to admit that there were shortcomings in this approach to studying memory. One of the biggest issues was that it was sort of an all or nothing type of test of memory. His research didn't necessarily look at how we could reproduce memory in different circumstances in different ways. It didn't help us look at memory of critical information that we really cared about. and didn't look at how our mind was constantly changing the memory that we had inside of our head. Instead, it was just this situation where we were given something and asked to recreate it out of thin air. And this led a lot of researchers, once we started to develop better mathematical models and skills and build off of these ideas of Ebbinghaus's, to say, well, how else could we look at memory in this same scientific manner? One of the first places we went was in the testing of memory. Nowadays, we tend to call Ebbinghaus's attempts to test memory a free recall test. Where we're given some piece of information and then asked to just simply reproduce that information without any hints, without any extra stuff, and we're hopefully asked to reproduce it in crystal clear, perfect form. This, of course, isn't necessarily how most tests of memory work in our real life. So lots of people thought maybe we could get at other sources of memory, other bits of information that we just need a little bit of jogging through testing memory in different ways. One of the tests that people started to implement in their research were these things called cued recall tests, where people were again given information that instead of being tested by just asking to recreate stuff, they were given cues or hints that could allow individuals to more readily access some of the information that was maybe hidden inside their head. An example of a cued recall test could be instead of me just asking you to name all 50 states in the United States, it would be me providing you with an image like you see in front of you that is a picture of the United States and then asking you to identify all 50 states. My guess is with that simple visual cue, most of you probably, if you've already retained that information in some form, get a few more of the 50 states, if not all 50 of the states by having that added visual cue presented to you, even though it might be very challenging to name all 50 in a free recall form. And that's the utility of these cued recall tests. You're not necessarily being given information that's not already in your head, but what you're being given is pathways to that information that's there. So even if something might not feel like it's quite there, there could be a way to, to kind of pluck it out and show that you've retained some bit of information that you've learned potentially a long time ago. Another test that's very similar to this is something called a recognition test. In recognition tests, people are asked not only to kind of recreate what they've been given, but they're giving the potential answers for what they're being asked to recreate. And their task in this particular situation is to just distinguish what they have in their head from what they've never had inside of their head. A classic example of this is be if I were to say, ask you to name the dwarves from Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. Now, some of you might have just recently seen that Disney video and could easily rattle off all seven of the dwarves. But my guess is the vast majority of individuals who's not seen that movie recently still, for some inexplicable reason, in the names of all seven dwarfs somewhere in your head that you just can't quite get to. So what we could do to see if that information is really there, instead of giving you a cued recall test or a free recall test, we could give you a recognition test, where I say, 
throw up all the potential names of the seven dwarfs and ask you from this exhaustive list to identify all seven. Now, I know some of you might really want to do this, so if you want to pause me, feel free to do so and see if you can find all seven. I promise they're there. But for this class and the sake of time, we're going to advance to some other types of tests that can be administered. So what else can be done to get at even more hidden knowledge than these cued recall tests and recognition tests can identify? One type of test, which sort of taps into the relationship between learning and memory, is something called a savings test, where indications of memory are not really shown through your ability to identify something, but instead your ability to learn something. A classic savings test that I love to do in classes when we have an abundance of time is to ask people to fill out an elemental table sheet. What we tend to find is that unless people are chemistry majors, most freshmen and sophomores taking this class do really poorly trying to identify all of the elements on the periodic table. In fact, we often find very little difference between those that have had a chemistry class before and had to memorize it and those that haven't. But something really interesting can happen if we take this activity a little bit further. If I ask people to identify themselves as those that have in the past been forced to memorize it in, say, junior high or high school or even some college class where they've already forgotten that information versus those that have never had to remember that information, and then ask those people to all, not only those that have memorized it, but those that have never had to, to try to spend a couple hours memorizing the elemental tables. And what we tend to find, and this is what savings tests are getting at, is that those that have had to previously memorize this stuff, even though they're not showing strong indications of memory through the classic tests of memory that we've talked about so far, even though they're not able to do that, those that have had to remember it in the past can quickly relearn the elemental table, can show this sort of uncanny ability to memorize where all the elements go, and in doing so, and have relearned this significantly faster than those that have never had to memorize the elemental tables. What memory researchers argue is that this innate ability to relearn this is an indication that there's some traces of memory still there in this person's head. This gets us to a really interesting area. It's a question of what things we can remember and what constitutes memory. More often than not, memory researchers have focused their attention on what we call explicit memories, things you can articulate about specific details. But there's a whole nother set of memories that memory researchers have become interested in called implicit memories, ones that focus on sort of bodily, kinesthetic, learned responses to specific things. And it can be that pit in your stomach that you get when you find yourself in an environment that's familiar. Or it can be that quick reflexory, classically conditioned response that you have to a stimulus because your bodies learn to pair specific stimuli together through classical conditioning. Now, these types of memory, these implicit memories, are sometimes very difficult to measure and quantify in research. It's really tough to know how long they last, how strong they are, how quickly you can accumulate them when you're not doing Give you the option to do the basic memory tests that we'd like to do on human beings. And that's because oftentimes these implicit memories are conflated with explicit memories. If I say, want to learn why you're getting that pit in your stomach when you find yourself in an environment, there's a good chance you can articulate what it was about that environment that's probably causing your stomach to lurch. It doesn't mean that your body's not learning something and it's not a specific type of memory, it's just, well, it's conflated with the explicit memories. Another classic example of this is learning to ride a bike. Most memory researchers argue that you actually have to develop implicit memory to be able to ride a bike successfully. But being able to tease it apart from the explicit memories that you're gaining about how to balance, what to do, how to go, is very challenging. So how could we tease these apart? Well, one of my favorite examples of how we tease these apart is 
involve individuals that experience a very unique type of amnesia because of damage to a specific area of their brain. This type of amnesia is called anterograde amnesia. It's a situation where the damage to the hippocampus and other cortical regions causes these individuals to no longer be able to form long-term explicit memories. They might have information about their past. They might be able to kind of understand the general gist of what they're encountering, but being able to remember encounters with specific individuals after the damage or things that they were supposed to re retain after they experienced the damage just isn't possible for these individuals. And what researchers have done to try to kind of tap in to whether or not implicit memory works or is unique, I guess, is look at how these individuals who are no longer capable of forming new explicit long-term memories do in comparison to those that can form new explicit memories on basic implicit memory tests. One of the ones that's done is something called the star tracing task, which you see to the right of this slide. In this slide, you see an individual looking at a mirror and trying to, by looking at the mirror, trace a star on a piece of paper that's in front of him. You'll notice that he can't see the star directly. He has to try to do it by using the reflected image that he's seeing in the mirror. Now, this might seem like an easy task, but if you've ever tried it, you'll quickly realize this is really challenging to be able to do this if you've never done it before. So what researchers will do to look at implicit memory in this example is they'll again take controls, people with the typical explicit memory abilities that we've talked about before, and these individuals struggling with anterior grade amnesia who can't form new memories. They'll sit them down, tell them the instructions, and everybody will do this star tracing task. And in the first iteration, usually there's no difference between those with implicit memory issues and those with, sorry, explicit memory issues and those without. Everybody, both the controls and the anterior grade amnesia individuals, struggle a lot the first couple times and get better as they progress and start to sort of learn the ways to use the mirror successfully. What's really interesting is what happens on the second day. If these individuals are brought back, both controls and those with anterior grade amnesia, both do a little bit worse the second time around, at least on the first go, but over a while, they improve. In fact, they get significantly better as that second day progresses. The catch is, those with anterior grade amnesia don't remember, like the controls, having ever done this before. So even though their performance increases the same way as the controls, there's no explicit memory of having done it, and usually they really struggle to explain why they could do this challenging task so easily. The third day, this trend continues, where almost all of the individuals in this study do pretty darn well right off the bat and continue to do really well in the star tracing task every time they're asked to do it. The only difference again is those with anterior grade amnesia have no ability to understand why they're so good at this task because they cannot recall having performed the task before. I know this might seem like a very roundabout test and an odd thing, but it brings us to a really big point. It gives us this sense of, oh, there are lots of ways to test memory, but there are lots of types of memories that we need to test. And this became very apparent as memory researchers started to expand their work. And it led us to another place where we had to come up with some key terms and definitions if we wanted to speak about memory in a scientific way. Another place we went when we tried to expand our language was just talk about how this memory process worked. So the steps required for us to display a memory regardless of what type of memory it was. The terms encoding, storage, and retrieval soon became key terms that all memory researchers were using to describe each step in the way when we were trying to get information to stick in our head. Encoding entailed us finding a way to convert some bit of information into something that we could potentially use later. 
Once that information was converted and put into our head, it then needed to stay there. And sometimes for a very short period of time, other times for an extremely long iteration. But that process of keeping the information in our head and what happened to that information while it was there was all part of this step that memory researchers called storage. And then when we were asked to recreate that information, to pull it up, no matter how it was stored, we gave this new process a name called retrieval. Many researchers trying to understand memory once we came up with these terms talked about instances and things that could affect us in all three stages of the memory process. In fact, we'll be looking at some of these in our next class when we describe both the strengths and shortcomings and kind of nuances to memory that we were able to recognize as memory research started to pick up. But for now, just hopefully you know the terms and the concepts that we're looking at here. Another way that memory researchers classify memory isn't in the process involved when we are creating these things we call memories, but instead how much time has passed since an external event occurred where we're being tested on that information. When we talk about this, we often refer to something called the temporal stages of memory. There's an argument that when something happens, we first have to pay attention to it. And these sensory inputs that we've talked about so far have to undergo some type of filtration process and eventually be processed in our very first stage of memory that we call our sensory memory. Now, if you get into a cognitive psych class, you'll learn about different types of attenuation models and different ideas as to how infinite our sensory memory work is. But just understand that sensory memory for many people, just looking at the basics of memory, is considered that first type of memory that we possess. After that, we move on to something called our short-term memory. Sometimes you might see it referenced as your working memory, even though there is a slight difference between what we consider short-term memory and what's coined working memory. The instances in this class, they're pretty close to synonymous, and they're both considered that next step in the memory process. If we're asked to recall something much, much later, usually something we've already worked with before, we're tapping into something called our long-term memory. And as you can see in this model, there's often a lot of feedback loops between our short-term memory and long-term memory as we pull up relevant stuff from our long-term memory to better understand what it is we're working with in our short-term memory at the time. And for stuff to get to our long-term memory, it first has to exist in our short-term memory and be stored in some way that fits maybe a grand scheme of other information we already have in our head. There is an interplay between all of these, but each of these have their own nuances that you would be expected to know moving forward in an intro to psych class. So let's break these down just a little bit more. As I mentioned before, our sensory memory is considered really the first hypothetical stage of memory that exists. It's sort of that juncture between sensation and perception and memory. Theoretically, our sensory memory works for all of our different senses. And we tend to fixate a little bit more on our verbal or our visual memory of information. But, you know, when we're talking about memory, our memory of specific tastes, smells, tactile experiences, you know, different sounds that we're hearing that aren't just verbal in nature, things we're saying that aren't just verbal in nature, are all a part of this sensory memory. And this memory, as I mentioned earlier, is something that really only lasts for a fraction of a second. Most of the stuff that comes into this sensory, what we call store, is often forgotten within a fraction of a second. And it's only the stuff that we deem important, either because of its real critical nature at the time or our insistence to pay attention to something based on our, our thoughts and cognitions, whatever it is, we, something is critical that stuff gets carried over. Everything else leaves. And the reason why it's so important to get rid of most of this stuff within a fraction of a second is because theoretically, our sensory memory, when it's tied to attention and all of the stimuli coming in, is relatively infinite, or at least really, really big. 
And again, for us to be able to process everything that we're experiencing in a given second, most of the stuff we're processing has to quickly be forgotten. It's just the critical stuff that lasts. So how do we know that this is how sensory memory works? Over a long period of time, it was just kind of this hypothetical thing that we insisted had to exist. We needed it for us to be able to attenuate different things and experience something that they learned about in a cognitive class called the cocktail effect. We didn't really have ways of testing the, the capacity or the, the kind of quick reactions to our sensory memory that existed. This was not until just recently that we were able to really verify its existence. And this is thanks to the work, about 70 years after sensory memory was proposed, by a researcher named George Sperling. Sperling, as the first computers came out, came to the realization that with a computer and its ability to have precise timing and precise coordination, it would be a tool, a mechanism, to test this hypothetical thing called sensory memory. And what he did to try to prove its existence and its large capacity, not infinite capacity, but at least large capacity, was create this apparatus where he would have on a computer screen, flashed in front of his participants, this collection of letters and numbers. Now this collection would only be flashed on a screen for a 20th of a second. Afterward, it would be removed, and in the first iteration of the study, not the one you see pictured here, but the first iteration of the study, people would be asked to recreate everything that they saw in the slide. Just to get a sense of what this is like, I thought we'd do a little activity here. Actually, scratch that. I just realized I got rid of that because this is not my class and it's really tough to do it in this way. Uh, what I would typically do is ask people to see an image, just like the one you see in front of you, flashed on this screen, and try to recreate everything that's there. And we almost always find, much like Sperling found, is people are usually only able to get about four to six items at most when they're only able to see it for a 20th of a second, they're asked to write down everything. And this might suggest that, well, you actually have pretty limited capacity. But Sperling argued that that just means that a lot of this stuff in our head, even if we're trying to pay attention to it, it's really fleeting unless we attend to it almost immediately. So in the second iteration of the study, what he did was again flash the 12 letter and number combinations on the screen. But this was then followed, once it went away, immediately by a tone, either a high-pitched tone, a medium-pitched tone, or a low-pitched tone. And he asked his participants in this iteration not to recall all the things that were flashed on the screen, but just the ones that corresponded to the tone that they had heard. If they heard the high-pitched tone, they were asked to recreate the top line. The medium-pitched tone, as you see here, they were asked to recreate the middle line. A low pitch tone, they were asked to recreate the bottom line. And what Sperling was able to find in this 1960 study and other iterations of it later on was that even though people could almost never get more than six items in the first study, which relates to about 50% of the total things that were presented to them, almost everybody within a few trials was able to get four out of four, four out of four, four out of four every time regardless of which row they were asked to recall. And what Sperling argued was that this was proof positive that our sensory memory was indeed pretty darn big, but also very fleeting. That shift of attention within a fraction of a second was enough to forget a large number of things that we theoretically did have in our memory in that first study. And this research has been built upon over the last couple decades to really highlight the importance of sensory memory and how there is a merger between memory and attention at this stage. As we mentioned before though, lots of stuff is forgotten, but the stuff that stays is the stuff that goes into something called our short-term memory. Now, this concept is what's often tied to that number we mentioned earlier from Ebbinghaus's work and other researchers that have referenced it called the seven, magic number seven plus or minus two. This notion that we usually have about seven, well, five to nine items that we can keep in our head at any given moment. Now, this short-term memory usually in memory research is tied to new stuff that we're encountering. 
but many researchers contend that in the real world, short-term memory is also something that's taken up in terms of capacity and then functioning based on past information that we're utilizing at any given moment. Essentially, when we're working on something or processing something, we're creating this merger between what's coming in and what's already in there so we can successfully navigate in the world around us. And the memories we're using in that moment are part of what we call our short-term memory. Now, these things that stay in here are usually there if we're not touching them for a few seconds to maybe a day if there's something that's really pressing on our head. And the vast majority of that is then either just completely forgotten or it moves into, if we've deemed it critical enough, some iteration of our long-term memory. And this is where things get murkier, though. As we mentioned, the long-term memory is really the next stage from short-term memory, but it's, it's much more complex than this. This is the stuff that gives memory researchers stomach aches. Because here, what we're looking at is the, not only the stuff from our short-term memory that we've deemed relevant, but previous stuff that we found ways to pair and mold and hold in our head for, theoretically, an indefinite amount of time. This memory is often extremely complex, with lots of struggles to kind of connect the dots as to where things came from and whether or not what we're storing is indeed accurate. And in fact, as we're going to talk about in the next class, there's a litany of research that suggested that this is a very malleable stage of memory. It's constantly being tweaked and bent every time we're either accessing long-term memories or we're adding new stuff that could potentially relate to a long-term memory that's in our head. We're going to get to more of this later, but just for now, understand that this is, again, the last temporal stage of memory that we've identified. We want to go even further into long-term memory and start breaking it up into some of the different categories that we talked about earlier. We've got the declarative memory, which is going to be either episodic, where it's a specific event, or semantic, just general knowledge-based stuff. And we've got this non-declarative or procedural memory that can relate to the classical conditioning we've talked about, but also relates to physical skills that we develop, like riding a bike, as we've talked about, or learning to kind of respond to a specific word in a specific way in almost an operant conditioning way. All of these different breakups of long-term memory not only helps researchers really specify the type of thing they're looking at, but it gives us a much clearer map of the complexities of memory and all the different things that we could potentially study. And hopefully, now that we've gone through these things, covered all these terms and concepts, we're feeling comfortable about what memory researchers can look at, where it's come from, and all the different things that we have to consider when we want to talk about things that are good and bad and can be tweaked with our memory. With that in mind, we're going to be moving on to a more application-based lecture on memory. But if you need to review, please do so, because there's a lot of really critical information that, again, not only is important for people interested in psychology, but can be applicable to everybody, moving on not only in this class, but future classes and future aspects of life. So please, review if needed. Hopefully I'll see you soon when we get into a really interesting topic on application-based use of memory research. Take care, all.